And there we go, we're recording. Okay, so um, everybody be extremely welcome to today's academic practice lunchtime seminar, um, our first lunchtime seminar of 2020. Um, my name is Johnny, I'm an academic developer here in academic practice, and I'm absolutely delighted to see such a wonderful turnout to today's event. Um, just again, in terms of recording as a piece of housekeeping before we kick off, um, just to make you aware that if you'd prefer not to have your likeness captured, please feel free to turn off your cameras, your audio. Um, and again, just uh, if you're not speaking on audio yourself, please mute yourself to minimize background disruption. Do please feel free, use the chat box to add comments, um, put questions in for the chat box for discussion, and that today's seminar is going to be a presentation followed by an open Q&A. Um, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Professor Diana Laurelard back to Trinity. Um, Diana is a professor at UCL. She holds um, a chair as Professor of Learning with Digital Technologies, which is held since 2005. Before that, she's held various positions related to learning technologies um, and is a former professor of educational technology at the OU. Among her many offer, among her many, many honors, she's been given lifetime achievement awards by the E-Assessment Association. She's a fellow of the UK Royal Society of Arts, and she's held some and she's held many senior public and academic positions throughout her career. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome Diana back to Trinity. I think possibly last with us at the Long Room Hub Symposium back in 2015, 2016. Um, and just to say once again that we're absolutely delighted to welcome her to today's event with the support of Ireland's National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. Um, just if you are keen to tweet about the uh, today's event, just a couple of handles to be aware of. Our own academic practice handle is probably the newest member of our own academic practice team at Trinity, and it's at TCD underscore AP. So if you're not following that, please do. And also just to highlight the forum's handle, which is at forum TL. And again, if you want to kind of tweet in or comment on what's happening with today's session, please do um, feel free to talk about that. Um, Oh, so I was just going to hand over to Diana there. Okay, Johnny, thank you very much. And thank you very much indeed for this uh, kind invitation to, to join you. Um, of course, it would be just wonderful to be physically in Dublin. And I really look forward to coming back again one day. I've so much enjoyed my visits there. Um, but here I am in gloomy lockdown London, and uh, I'm going to be much cheered by um, a session talking with you about um, some of these interesting issues we all now have to, um, to contend with. So I'm just sharing my screen and starting the presentation and hoping that you should now see a full slide. So the focus of this talk is assessment strategies, especially in the context of the online and digital world that we all now live in, but with an emphasis also on what can be scaled up. Assessment typically requires an awful lot of labor intensive work by teachers, which is of enormous value to students, but we, and what we have to be sure of is that we don't diminish that. But what we can try and do with some of these new technologies is to extend the kind of assessment offerings that we offer our students. Because some of the methods of online assessment can also be of great value to them without necessarily creating too great a workload for the teachers, especially when we have very large cohorts. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. It always helps if we ground our discussions of innovations in learning and teaching in some kind of theoretical context. I'm going to start by thinking about what counts as high quality learning experience and use the conversational framework to provide a sort of theoretical context for thinking about, um, thinking through how best we can develop ways of assessing students. And then towards the end, I come to the issue of how we spread this huge innovation load we now have? How can we as a teaching community work together to develop all this new knowledge that we now need to develop? Well, some years ago, I developed a conversational framework to try to address this question of what counts as high quality learning. That was when we were facing the first influx of uh, new technologies and people were kind of rushed to the latest thing. And the question is, what do you really want to try and do with the technology, not what does it do? 
So the framework is really a simple distillation of the main theories of teaching and learning over the last century and a bit of this century as well. And it's pretty much the simplest way I think there is to represent the teaching learning process is basically a series of exchanges between a learner and a teacher and between a learner and their peers and at the two levels of both concept and practices. And this representation of the teaching learning process describes essentially what it takes to learn and educators and use it therefore to test their own pedagogic value of these new digital methods that we're all now developing because it works across both conventional and digital methods and all sectors and subjects. So this is the complete conversational framework in which we can see that it's, it's embracing six learning types. And these are meant to be six distinct learning types, all of which work together to complement and enhance each other, even though each is distinct from all the others. And it derives from a wide range of research studies and teaching learning theories. And the slides contain some references so that uh, it's possible to follow up on that and you will have access to the slides. But the essential point is that all these types of learning work together to complement and enhance each other. We don't want to focus on any one too much, but they're all of value to the students and they all work together. We can link each type of learning. I'll now go through each one individually to try and make sense of, of what they actually cover. Um, and we can uh, link each one to a specific part of the framework and beginning with acquisition, this is where the teacher is communicating concepts and ideas. And there's a bit of color coding here because the, the black is where there's some input coming to the student. And the red is when the student is doing something. Now, as the teacher is communicating concepts that should change the learner's own conception to some degree. And then they do some more presentation. We hope it changes a bit more. But the learners themselves are not generating new ideas. They are using what is coming in. For learning through inquiry, that's a bit different because here the learner is actively exploring or questioning the teacher's concepts and from what they find, whether it's online or in a book, in the library, or asking the teacher as a resource themselves, they then get something back which further helps to develop their own concepts. So this, these sort of continued iterations produce more kind of conceptual activity by the learner than simply learning through acquisition, because there are more opportunities for them to generate questions, do something with the answers they get, process what they get. So the idea is that the more cycles there are of the student thinking about something, then the more opportunities they have to develop and change their ideas. For learning through practice, the learner is using a learning environment which has been set up by the teacher, and that will depend very much on the kind of uh, context that you're in. And they're asked to achieve a goal, some kind of goal, which is set up by the teacher. They generate an action, they get feedback, and then they respond with a revised action um, with getting more feedback. Sometimes they might also be encouraged to use their practice to change their concept and vice versa, and so generate a better action. So that what's important here is that we find ways in which learners are able to get concepts and practices iterating and joining up, seeing the links between them. So we can see how important practice is because it's, it's naturally allowing them to try and do that. Then for learning through discussion, the same kinds of iterations happen, but here they're in discussion with peers and the social construction of ideas helps them develop their concepts. They have to generate questions and they'll get questions back or feedback from their peers and then they have to respond with, with more answers. So again, these iterations are engaging them in the process of developing their concepts further. But this is not directly engaging with practice. This is reflecting on practice perhaps, but not directly engaging with it. And then for learning through collaboration, each, le each learner here is learning through practice to some degree because in collaboration, you're making something, your work coming together to make something. The making may, may not be a physical thing, it might be a, a design or a, um, some material object, but it might just as easily be something like a definition or an interpretation or a summary or an analysis, a comparison, could be all kinds of things. But then with collaboration, they're sharing their practice and also linking both discussion about what they're doing with what they've actually done. And learners have the opportunity to see each other's uh, outputs as well, which they've also made in this um, um, 
learning environment con context. So collaboration is important because it takes students beyond discussion. In collaboration, you have to negotiate what they're making together, what they're doing in practice. So it's more engaging than just discussion alone or than just practice alone. Collaboration is the only one of these learning types, which is a combination of the others. And I, I really wanted to leave it out because I wanted this nice clean analysis, which has five generally distinct learning types, but it's just too important and it's convenient to have this sort of combined uh, learning type working this way. Uh, and then finally, we have learning through production. And this is where the student is being asked to reflect on what they've learned to communicate it to the teacher. So they're bringing their concepts and practices together, thinking that through. They might produce it in the form of an essay or a performance or presentation to show what they've learned. And then the feedback from the teacher should enhance and consolidate their learning further. So learning through production is clearly what we use in the form of when we're talking about assessment. This is where learners always have to produce some kind of evidence to demonstrate what they've learned. And if the learner has to produce something for the teacher or sometimes for the class, then it's motivating. And that's why we use um, assessment because it's one of the things that persuades students to focus on their learning process, to do this work of thinking, so what is all this about? How do I join up my concepts and practice and then represent that in a form that others can process? Okay, so this is the complete conversational framework showing those key distinctive types of learning that all teachers use at some point at all levels in all subject areas. And so for the teacher, the message of this framework is that ideally we design learning sessions that use several of these types of, le of learning to keep those cycles of processing together. So the central panel here is the typical learner representing all learners. And all of these interactions and exchanges with the teacher, interacting with the learning environment, interacting with other peers, exchanging objects and developing things with other peers, all of those are gonna help this process of the learner developing their concepts and practices and skills. So we can represent the wide range of methods that we've all been using all the time in conventional uh, methods of learning and teaching. And this is why you discover that you've always been speaking prose essentially, because there's nothing new about this. You will recognize all these things. So for learning through acquisition, of course, we use lectures. For learning through inquiry or investigation, we use the library um, conventionally. For learning through practice, we've always used labs or field trips or something like that. We've always had discussion groups of getting students to work together and discuss together. And indeed group projects, which is where they come together to collaborate. And for um, production, learning through production, they'll do things like um, having to write a report or a, an essay or um, design something to demonstrate what they've learned. And of course, as teachers, what we try to do is to encourage all these different types of learning. We tend to take care most of learning through acquisition. And that's what we will find very often that a lot of teachers focus on naturally and try to make sure that the other things happen. You know, go to the library and you work in the lab and of course people design labs very carefully. But these are all the, all these active forms of learning when the learners are not with the teachers necessarily. So working out how best to support that is, is very important. And then with digital methods, of course, and online learning, we have a much wider range of technologies than we've ever had conventionally. And we can use all of these to design for learning. I'm just gonna offer a small selection so that for acquisition, learning through acquisition, we can use digital images or videos. For learning through inquiry, we can get students to explore the internet. For learning through practice, testing a digital model, for example, is extremely valuable because here, the digital environment itself is giving students feedback on their actions. If you're trying to test, for example, the parameters in a model of climate change, then it makes them really think hard. You know, how am I going to get the global mean temperature down to two degrees? What do I have to change? So that's, um, and then they see the results of their actions from that digital model. So there are some very powerful ways in which we can bring the digital world into these different types of teaching. For discussion, we use, well, all kinds of online forums, text chat, Mentimeter, and this is one of the ways in which we can foster discussion among students. 
For collaboration, you might get students drafting a wiki. Now, the, the great thing about the digital world is that you can exchange digital objects with each other. And so you can work on the same digital object together. Having to make that digital object something which you share, and so you may have to debate long and hard to de define precisely what it should be, and all of that's valuable for learning. And then for learning through production, you may, might get every student making their own website or creating their own PowerPoint anim animation, all kinds of things. Whatever the teacher is doing to explain an idea, you can get students to do to explain an idea, to, to explain how they think about it. So with digital and online technologies, we have a huge new toy box of intriguing ways of supporting student learning and understand these uh, different ways in which we can do that. So what does this tell us about assessment? Well, you notice this color coding here. This is um, for all the students being active in all the red ones, but receiving input in all the black ones. Um, and, of course, all the red ones, therefore, are opportunities for assessing what, um, what they're actually learning and how they're articulating that or expressing it. So if we remove all those inputs and just look at the different kinds of student outputs and what we can learn from them when they're using digital environments, then we're beginning to, looking, beginning to look at assessing what students are learning. Now, we hear a lot these days about learning analytics and how useful these will be, but, but honestly, a lot of the time, what learning analytics are, are all the parameters that online technologies find easy to offer us, to track and present to us. And technologists like us to think that we can learn from those, but actually rarely are they of interest if we really want to understand student learning because they're not the things that teachers have said, we need to know this about students. So the kinds of things we get out of these opportunities are much likely to be better. So let's look at, at what we can do. Well, if you're thinking about learning through inquiry and you send students to do some inquiry learning on the internet, then you have the means to track what they do, the search terms they use and the strategies they use, especially if you refine a certain set of readings that they should look at or something like that, um, so that you have access to the way in which they access those readings. That's an opportunity to find out what their strategies of exploration and analysis are. Um, if you're um, doing something like uh, assessing students with any, any kind of assessment or assignment we give students, we can get them to create digital objects and assess those digital objects. Now, as I was mentioning, you can get students to do something like um, uh, creating uh, a PowerPoint animation. Well, suppose you're, doing, you're teaching something like the water cycle in physics is a nice example, because there's all sorts of nice animated models of how the water cycle works. We'll get the students to express that in the form of an animation. And it requires much more detailed thinking than just writing a, a, a word description. And students love making things digitally, so um, assessing them through the creation of what they can do with different kinds of digital tools could be very valuable. And then with um, <clears throat> learning through practice, well, if they are using the kind of digital tool that I mentioned, most digital tools will be tracking performance in some way or other. With all of these things, students have to be aware if their report, uh, performance is being tracked. But it's valuable to the teacher to look at what they're doing because it gives you a sense of how they're thinking and what kinds of strategies they're not taking advantage of. So having that opportunity, wherever you can find it within your own subject area would be um, uh, extremely useful to you. Discussions, well, in um, any online discussions, if you're using Moodle or any of those kinds of VLEs, then there's the opportunity for getting students discussing among themselves. And they produce much more discussion there than there's ever time for in a face-to-face -face session. They can spend more time thinking about what they do. You get more people coming into it because they're not so shy of, of putting themselves into text as they are speaking in the classroom. So that's a wonderful opportunity for, for, for seeing how they think, how they respond to each other. And if you set up good discussion topics, then that's another way to see what they're really learning, how they're uh, expressing themselves. And then with uh, collaboration, well, they're, they're making things again, so you can look at their designed outputs. And um, as we come to uh, looking at what we can do within the context of scalable assessments, 
we should be able to see all of these kinds of opportunities coming up. Um, and so that's what I want to get to now. Scalable forms of assessment. Well, I'm going to go through just three. And what I'm really thinking about here is trying to think through how we can give high quality learning to the students without making the teachers do too much very labor intensive work in order to achieve that. So let's go through the first one, peer review online. Well, um, what I've done here is to try to work out what students are doing over a certain amount of time and what teachers are doing. And this, I mean, if we're talking about efficiency of teacher workload and quality for students is, is, is essentially, it's a kind of efficiency argument, then it's a numbers game. So there's a lot of numbers in these slides. Um, because once you've created this task, there is nothing for the teacher to do except um, make sure that they are, have created the first draft of something using a, a particular rubric. It might be, say, um, a summary of a chapter or something like that. So they've got 30 minutes to do that. And then each student gets two other students' draft summaries to assess. And let's take uh, against the rubric and comment on it. So that's feedback, peer feedback to the student. And then each individual student checks the two feedback reviews they've got and also reflects on um, what they saw as they were um, evaluating other students' answers and uses those things to revise and submit their own answer to the teacher. So that's about an hour and a half's work for the students, none of which the teacher is involved in once they've set it up on VLE. So each student students have produced their own answer, they reviewed two, reviewed two, they've revised their own in light of the two reviews and the experience of doing those reviews, and submit what will now be an improved draft to the teacher. All the teacher does is to provide the rubric and receive these relatively improved assignments to grade. And we all know that better quality assignments are much easier to give feedback on than those which are just missing the basics. So that should be beneficial to the teacher. Scaling up pyramid groups. Well, pyramid groups are the kinds of things that, that you do with a very large class of students. And I'm thinking about 90 students here. And you want a, <clears throat> a meaningful process by which they can have a, a meaningful discussion and you can give feedback, but you don't have too much work to do. So if you do something like this, where you, you begin with 90 students each doing their own individual response and writing that down, and then you break them into groups of three. So you've now got 30 groups, each comparing three and producing therefore 30 responses. Let's say each group is taking 10 minutes to do that. And then you break them into groups of uh, 15 students where they discuss how they would vote on five of these. So you give each group just five to vote on. And so these six groups are then producing six right analyses of what, what we think are good answers to this question. So what the teacher ends up with is just six um, uh, responses from this whole group of 90 students to comment on, and each student creates their own response, engages in one discussion, one joint vote, and receives teacher feedback. Now, if you're taking that online, again, once you've set it up, you don't have to do much, but you have to, this is face-to-face, -face, so the teachers are all the time. This is um, online, so the teacher just comes in for the 10 minutes of giving feedback. Elijah. Sorry, was that somebody talking to me? No, okay. Um, so this is, is much the same thing. You've split, say, 600 students into um, groups of 10 students, having each one respond to the open question, and then they join a group of 10 students to discuss, say, 10 responses, and then vote to get 60, and then you combine them again to get six responses. And again, the teacher has a manageable number of responses to, to, to work with, but each of those students has had the meaningful exercise of creating their own, discussing with other students, and then voting on a bunch of other responses to, to make a judgment about what's best, and then everybody receiving your feedback. So again, it's, it's a way of trying to see how you create quality time for those students working together, but not over massively overworking the teacher, but still getting teacher feedback coming. The final one is concealed multiple choice questions. Now, multiple choice questions are pretty ubiquitous in many subject areas. Um, so we're never going to get rid of them. Um, I'm just talking about the form of the multiple choice question here. Um, so this is a very simplistic kind of um, multiple choice question. I was just asking about 
the ordering of letters in the alphabet. So what number of the alphabet do you think the letter P is? Well, you might make a guess and say it's 15. What you'll get as the answer is wrong, try again. What is the number for P? And you just have to guess again, basically, or try and think through and work it out if you um, count through. A concealed multiple choice question will conceal the choices and begin with an open question like, what is the number for the letter U? You make a guess, say, of 22, but now you get some meaning, some opportunity to say, which is the closest to your answer? So you're not guessing, you're just saying, well, it's one of these two, let's pick 23. And the answer you get here is informational feedback. It's not just no guess again, it's that's the number for W. What is the number for U? And you've got the means to work that out now, because if, if you know that it goes U, V, W, then it's two before 23, obviously, so it must be 21. So it's a different way of processing, essentially the same kind of information, but in the first case of just multiple choice questions, it's inviting guessing, it's giving you unhelpful feedback, unless you give a kind of hint or something which is meant to help the students without them having to do much, too much thinking. So there's no real processing going on. You know, those cycles aren't going. Not only that, the students have to think about wrong answers and processing what a wrong answer is, is, is not the best kind of pedagogy, honestly. Whereas with concealed multiple choice questions, you're reducing the guessing, you're providing this kind of informative feedback, which helps students work it out. So it is inviting processing. You also get to log all these open-ended question answers which can guide you towards making better questions in future and so on. So how do these forms of assessment map onto the framework? Well, the cognitively useful transactions involved in peer review are, for example, that you're creating a draft, doing some self-review, then sending that to someone else and seeing what they've done, then discussing it, <coughs> sorry, through the form of sending feedback and also receiving feedback. So peer review prior to handing in something to a teacher is quite a complex process for um, students doing lots of different types of learning. With the pyramid collaboration, it's slightly different. You begin by thinking about your own response. You then contribute that to a discussion group. You get some comparison discussion going on and people arguing about what it should be. You then share your joint response to the whole group and you get the teacher discussing feedback for the whole group. So again, that's quite a complex process, um, two sorts of discussion and a bit of practice. And for the, uh, sorry, for the um, uh, CMCQs, you get the question, you have to think of the answer, you get some informative feedback, and that makes you think about what am I supposed to be doing here and how can I make it better in a way that just guessing in multiple choice questions doesn't say much. So those are the learning types involved in each of these. And that's why I think it's quite helpful to think in terms of the conversational framework. You get a sense of what are you really getting to students, students to do and what am I as a teacher being able to see as a result. <coughs> Excuse me. So finally, um, this issue of how on earth are we going to do all this innovation that we now have to do? One of the ways we're doing that is setting up this course on Future Learn, now running, and I'm giving you the, um, uh, the course link there, should you like to join us. And <coughs> we get student uh, teachers to share all these ideas because there must be a thousand interesting ways of doing these kinds of scalable um, assessment, but we need to share them, find out what they are. And the learning design is the tool by which we do it. It's free, it's open, it's online. So anyone can use it and uh, use it to represent what they're doing to help students. So to summarize, we've seen the six contrasting uh, types of learning and all of the active learning types, that's everything other than learning for acquisition, are opportunities for teachers to capture students' outputs in, in a digital environment. That creates lots of opportunities for scalable assessment methods, and I've discussed three, each of them mappable to the conversational framework, and it'd be great to hear about some more ideas that people have. And one way of hearing about those is to share them with other teachers in our online course. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions, comments, and indeed challenges. Now, just stop sharing. And we can move into discussion. Okay.
Okay, so if I can just very briefly jump in there, Diana, I think that was a really um, rich and thought-provoking presentation. And um, I mean, I could probably hog this conversation by coming out with a string of questions all on my own, but I'm not going to. Um, so I wonder perhaps if um, I've, I've kind of made a note of a couple of people whose points I might want to address, but if anybody would like to go straight to questions, either pop something in the chat box or, or go on mic, if you could just raise your hand so that Diana would know to expect you, that would be great. There's, there's some great comments in there. I mean, they're quite long. I'm not sure I can process those quite so quickly. If we get people to put their hands up to ask a question, Johnny, maybe that would be a more immediate way of doing it. It'd be good to see that. I like that comment about defaulting to PowerPoint and other multimodal tools are more effective. Well, there are so many digital tools out there, you know, now. And um, just in the last three weeks of running this course and getting teachers to say what they're using at the moment as digital tools, I've learned an enormous amount. You know, it, it's so hard to keep up with these things. And the range of opportunities is just great. Ah, oh, there's um, Eleanor talking about, um, <laughs> don't put too much emphasis on the quality of the end result, but keep the emphasis on the content. Is everybody, everybody's got access to the chat, haven't they? If students make a video, one may only be able to record themselves talking while others may be able to animate. Content can be very the same format, very different. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's fine letting them uh, um, express themselves. The one thing about getting students to create um, digital media as articulations of what they know is that it can be awfully easy for them to get so caught up in the creation of the media that really the amount of time they spend on thinking about the representation may be non-commensurate with the amount of time the whole thing takes. One has to be careful about that. Um, Diana, I see Kira O'Farrell has put her hand up. Kira yeah. is our Director of Academic Practice here at Trinity. Um, and Kira, would you maybe want to come on mic there? Yeah, Johnny, thank you. I actually couldn't find the hand button um, no, it's between true. screens and Zoom. Yeah, it's actually just if anyone is looking for it, if you click on participants down at the, the, the bottom um, and you'll see under the list of participants, there's one of the options to raise your hand is on the right hand side. Um, Diana, it's, that was fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Um, sorry. Yeah, that was that was fascinating. And thank you so much. There's so much to think about there. Um, I was really interested in your conversational framework and in the various types of learning that we have. And one of the things that we have been um, discussing, kind of in, informally here at academic practice, is we're wondering has that acquisition learning a focus on lectures and a more didactic learning is that has, has that become more problematic since this emergency pivot to teaching where we're just trying to get everything online and done and, and, and for the students and all trying very hard but has that um, ha, do you see that that pivot resulting in more didactic teaching in the short term well, it's an interesting question because I see it going both ways, actually. I mean, there, there certainly, I, I was very aware at UCL that people immediately reached for lecture cast and lecture capture and, you know, recording their lectures as they normally would present them. But lectures can be 40, 50 minutes long. And to watch anything like that on, you know, these things, these laptops, which have a thousand of other interesting things to do, to expect every student to sit through a 50 minute lecture that's expecting a lot. I'd like to know how many academics clicking on a video, watch it for 50 minutes. That's tough. So there was certainly too much reaching for that, you know, close as possible emulation of what I do in the classroom. Um, but on the other hand, people quickly began to realize, actually, this is nonsense. <laughs> you better not do it this way at all. And started making their presentations much shorter. And I was horrified to see that mine was just 25 minutes just now. It was supposed to be 20. And I, I, I really hate going over like that. That's not good. Um, 
but it's um it's much better to break it up and to have maybe 10 15 minutes and then a poll or a quiz or a discussion anything to keep the student interest and momentum up so they've got something to do within the lecture now with any luck that will transfer back into the classroom when we come out of this wretched thing and there will be much less of that you know 50 long minutes of doing nothing but scribbling down what the, the lecturer is saying or, or whatever uh, so I, I think it can work in both directions and I'm, I'm hopeful that as teachers discover these different kinds of tools that we don't now do have available that there will be much more blended learning goes on there'll be a much better way of using that that classroom time thank you yeah and it's not just a pious hope i do see that happening anybody wanting to put their hand up if you click on reactions right at the bottom of the screen that's where they've put raised hand now it has changed uh, trying to see if there's any questions coming up in there um somebody's saying can we get the links for the courses in the chats yes i think i can probably do that hi diana can you hear me yes i can Hi, this is um, Adrienne. I, I have my hand up, but I, I don't think it's appearing. I'm not sure. Um, thanks for the, the lovely presentation. I do appreciate it. I was intrigued by um, scaling up pyramid discussion groups. It was the first time I heard about it. Um, I found it a little bit confusing and I was wondering, could you just go back over it a little bit, if you don't mind, again? Yeah, of course. Yes, it is confusing. That's why I was apologizing for it all being a numbers game. But, you know, this is what we're talking about. We're um, let me just share my screen. Um, you will have all these slides, so you can pour over it at your leisure, eventually. Um, let me pull out the whole thing so that it's easier to see. Um, this is something that we used to do when I worked at the Open University for a long time and in, um, in our summer schools. There used to be huge numbers of students in a particular class and you could very often get up to 70 or 80, 90. And these pyramid discussion groups worked extremely well in this face-to-face -face process like this. So you start with 90 students producing one response each. They've got five minutes to just think on their own. That's important. Then you break up into groups of three. So you, each group of three students is comparing their three responses and saying, so what are we think about this and how do we put those together to answer this question it should be quite a challenging question um, so they've got to really think hard about it and so so then you've got 30 responses so each group posts their response to a google doc or something like that and then you portion your students into six groups of 15 students and then you tell you give each group of 15 students five of these 30 responses to um, think about, discuss and vote on which is the best of these, which they then put onto the same Google Doc. So now you've got six responses produced from 90 students thinking on their own and discussing in groups and voting. So there's been quite a lot of processing going on by the students. And now they've got the opportunity to hear the teacher feeding back on those six different things that that group of students have said is a good answer to this question. Now, does that part make sense? Yes, I suppose my query was, is it synchronous? Or is this all happening? It's all synchronous in, yeah, okay. um, in a face-to-face, -face, yes. Online, you can do what you like. It could be done in a, in a synchronous session. If you do it asynchronously, then you can give students much more time. I mean, I put, I don't know if you can see my whole screen here. I've got the chat thing getting away. Yeah, um, I can see your screen. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, you know, students have, haven't got that much time to discuss here. There's 10 minutes and then five minutes to vote. And then um, it's not a huge amount of time. So you could spread this out much more if it were all online. So you could have um, a, oops, a kind of um, scheduled series of by Tuesday, five o'clock, you've got to have all put in your, your own response and then split into your groups and discuss and then by Wednesday um, midday, you've got to have posted 
what you think is the best response of those 10 that you've received and so on. So once you've, you've set that up asynchronously, the students can take as long as they like to, to discuss together. So you're, you don't have the constraints that you have in a face-to-face -face context. Um, so, so this one, you know, you've got um, still these three stages, you've got very large group here, so they can't do much discussion. They can, all they can really do is vote. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's a way of managing very large numbers, but still getting some quality time out of it for the students. Thanks so much. It more sense, though, <laughs> yeah, it does. I was just intrigued by it. It just, it, I suppose it looks huge, um, but you've broken it down quite well. And did you get good feedback um, from students? Oh, students um, loved it, yes. And so did the teachers. Because, I mean, in a face-to-face -face context, you can sort of wander around and chat to the groups, which is, is nice anyway. Um, and then if you, if you run it online, as I said, it's much better to run it asynchronously. And then you come together for that final chat through what they've all done. Thank you. Um, Marion. Hello, Diana. Thank you very much for a great presentation and for, I really enjoy your framework. And actually, just on an aside, I've had a student use some of your work in their master's program to very good effect. So thank oh, you. Thank you. What you're bringing me to is right back for us as, as teachers, as lecturers, is, is back to lesson planning. Because what I'm hearing in the question Adrian asked is really about that nuts and bolts of lesson planning. Now, I, I trained as a second level teacher oh, nearly 40 years ago, and I hated doing lesson plans. We all did. But I'm looking back over that, the discipline it gave us. And I think where, where the next step from what you've given us, which is fantastic, is for that actual choreography and I call it choreography of when I do where and the first time and that's why teaching is so hard the first time the first time you have to think it through every single step Absolutely. and the second time it's a little bit easier and by the time you've done it four times and that's why class face-to-face -face teaching is so easy because we've done it before we're now doing this in a different environment so it's almost like um you know let's write the lesson plan for one of the things you've given us, like the scalable thing, mm -hmm. including the sort of preparation, because the scalable multiple choice questions require a fair bit of preparation. And mm -hmm. let's write the lesson plan and then do it. And I think, and I'm, I'm not working full time, I'm retired now, but I think what I get from people is that the, just the sheer rush, the sheer year that people have had, yeah. is that stopping and doing that nuts and bolts feels you don't have the time. But actually what I'm hearing you argue is take that time do it in that very detailed way and then your learning is so much more and we can take it back out um i mean i used web ct and then blackboard for 15 16 years mm -hmm. and by the time i'd used it to the end there were things i just wouldn't go back to doing a face-to-face way because mm -hmm. i did peer review with this and those kind of things and i, I think you're you're giving us that to the basic craft of teaching but in a different context Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, that's a very good way to put it, because it's about being able to articulate the detail of your pedagogy. And I'll show you a more fun way to do it. I mean, we haven't got time. Can I do this, Johnny? Can I just take two minutes? Um, because I'm going to share my screen again, because that is what the learning designer is meant to be for, is to enable you to express the detail of your pedagogy. And um, if I click on that link, that actually take me through. Looks as though it's trying to. Oh, but it's only doing it on my screen. It's not doing it on your screen. Eek. Um, if I move it up, can you see it there? If I put it on my other screen? Yes. Oh. Yes, we can see it now. Diana, just to flag, um, I accidentally muted you instead of my, uh, instead of unmuting myself. So can you please check that? Sorry, misclick on my part. Diana, I'm not sure uh, you're on mute currently. Could you just check that? Thank you.
Can you hear me now? Yes. I don't think I can do both of these things at the same time because when I switch to unmute, it um, does it. Well, anyway, look, we don't have the time, and um, uh, I shouldn't really be taking time to um, away from your your questions. But you've got the you you will have the slides. You've got the link, so please just take a look. But it's um, it's kind of fun because the pie chart, which you might have caught a glimpse of checks on how much, what proportion of each of the learning types you've used as you develop the, the thing. So you get some feedback and what proportion of time students are in whole class or individual or group sessions as well. So, so it's kind of fun and it's a very good way for teachers to share that detail of pedagogy. Okay, so it's a very nice question, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, Johnny, will, are you going to invite people or can I just Pick on people who've just pick on up. people so who have their hands up. Um, just to flag that we yeah, are coming up on ten to two, so one, maybe two more questions, and then I think we should uh, wrap up. But um, for now, please go ahead. Okay, fine. So I think Peter Stone is next. Peter, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just a question about the asynchronous versus syn uh, synchronous um, way of, of of doing this. Um, I certainly see the, the advantages in the online of doing it asynchronously but the difficulty I, I would expect us there is you know in the online setting students to just disappear you know you ask them to provide reviews for someone else's work other students work and they just don't and so one student provides reviews and then they don't get any reviews in return or something like that um do you have, do you have thoughts for how to kind of control that kind of uh, problem in an asynchronous setting well, I mean, that's absolutely true. And the way I controlled it was just by making it compulsory. You know, that was, that was what they had to do. And you didn't, you didn't get through completing all of the um, parts of the, I mean, this was, all, this was on Moodle. Um, so you didn't get through it unless you, you, you did your citizen, your good citizen um, offer of reviewing. And even then, you know, some students just get by that by doing token reviews, which really disappoints people. So it's really sad when there's that kind of community breakdown. So you have to do a lot of work of persuading people that this is an important part of the process. It's an important skill for you. You know, this will be of value to you. And actually, when we've done um, evaluations of uh, people's assessment of the most valuable parts of a MOOC, for example, the different sorts of um, uh, activities we use, doing a peer review has come out, voted the highest value even above the videos and things like that. Receiving a peer review comes much lower down the list. <laughs> but it would, wouldn't it? It's the same for all of us. We think, you know, this person hasn't read my paper properly. Well, that's, you know, that's the same for students. So um, I, I do believe in the value of it. And if you can convey that to students, then they might come along with you better. And otherwise, all you've got left is making it compulsory. Fair point, though. Pauline Rooney is next, I think. Hi, that's me, Diana. Thanks very much for a, a really interesting talk. Um, my question is about the future. Um, and there's been lots of discussion, as you know, around the impact of COVID-19 on our future teaching, learning and assessment practices and how we might take what we've learned over the past year to um, inform our approaches in the future. And I was wondering, what do you see as a future of assessment? in higher education and do you have any thoughts on how we might how we might get there i think the really difficult bit is the last one um, i mean i have imaginings of what we could be doing and the last year has been so interesting in seeing how people have discovered and embraced digital methods in a way that you know people like me have been arguing for this for decades and you know a wretched worldwide pandemic has been the answer to all our prayers it's horrible that's what it took to enable people to just open up to this as a possible way of doing things and it's my it's my firm belief and hope that this will have created a, an ongoing change that people will think about bringing digital methods in much more than they ever did before so that's my hope but then how do we really get there means Everybody who is, in, who is a teacher, and in higher education it can be especially difficult because your teaching um, competes with your research and all the rewards are in research and 
not nearly so much in doing good teaching. I know it's possible to get promoted and everybody, every institution's got, you know, you can get promoted through teaching, but you know, the, the honors go to the researchers um, practically every time. So it's really tough. So that was one of the reasons for developing things like the conversational framework and indeed the learning design was to, to lower the barrier of getting engaged and thinking about teaching and then sharing ideas as we do in the MOOCs and creating that kind of um, knowledge building community because we've all got so much to learn. You know, there is a lot to learn here. So that's my hope for the future of education is that teachers come together to learn and the learning designer is, is in, in my wildest dreams, it's the equivalent of the journal article for scholarship and science. That's how we communicate our ideas to other people. That's how, if I'm starting to do something new, I don't just pitch in, I go and find out what other people have done. And then I take that, make it my own, improve on it, give it back to the community. Now the learning designer is a means of doing all that with your pedagogic ideas. So can we make something like that work that's low enough cost, it's just something you have to do anyways, think about how am I going to deal with this, and make it easy enough for teachers of all kinds to embed that as part of their normal professional practice. So it seems like a wild hope, but you know, we've got the technology. What we need now is the educational leadership. And I don't mean at the level of colleagues here, I really mean at, at institutional level and for schools at national level as well as institutional level, at least, um, well, universities are broadly speaking autonomous. You know, it is up to us what we do about the future of our education. And we have the means to do it. Um, that Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I, I'm going to have to hop in here. I'm afraid I'm going to, while well, I'm really reluctant to, I don't want to wrap this up. I think we're only really settling into our stride as, as kind of conversation, um, kind of conversations drawing on the conversational framework, if you will. Um, so I suppose really I do have to wrap it up at this stage. Um, two things to throw out for everyone else. Um, just to kind of to, to highlight Claire Donahue's question in the, in the chat, perhaps maybe this is something, if you want to join the conversation and keep the conversation going, that this could happen on Twitter, is how can we resist? How can we stop the drift back? How can we be sure that we prevent from going back the way things were? How can we take the benefits of interactivity that online or digital education affords us and embed that into everyday practice? And I think that's a really, really... Um, interesting place to, to to fall under here and again just to, to highlight Julie's point that's been gone into the chat um really it's a call to action at, at every level of the academy um how can we connect with each other how can we connect with leadership to support that so um and I'm afraid sadly it's coming up on five to two I am going to have to draw a line under it here um if I can just ask everyone to say um perhaps if you want to either use the the clap icon or if you want to unmute yourselves and, and clap in person whichever you prefer but really just to say thank you very much to Diana for joining us it's been an incredibly stimulating session um, some really interesting discussions coming afterwards and we hope to uh, welcome as many as possible of you back to a future academic practice seminar. Um, maybe perhaps feedback is a good one to, uh, positive feedback is always a good note to end on. Maybe we should um, get the next one. Some, some great questions and I do hope you can preserve that chat along when you've got, you've got recorded everything so it should be there when you get the recording. Because I don't want to miss all that. There's some really yeah. good points coming up in there. I think, Johnny, it's Kira here. We, we, we're, we're going to um, preserve the chat. And we also thought it might be useful to pull together some of the ideas that our fellow academics had um, and to get that into a one-page resource, which we'll, uh, we'll, we'll send on to everyone who is here. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. Very good. Thank Keep you. Keep the conversation going. Thank you, Diana. That was fantastic. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you again sometime. Mm-hmm.